Good morning. Is everybody awake this morning? It's good to see you here for our services. I know sometimes we've uh, gotten into some new habits, and we're going to try to get back to the old habits. So hopefully in another couple of weeks, it'll be completely open for us. But we're going to begin, so let's all stand, if you would. We're going to sing 459 if you had a songbook, but you don't. So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to put the lyrics up on the screen. Leaning on the everlasting arms. See, old habits are hard to break, aren't they? Leaning on the everlasting arms. What a fellowship, what a joy divine. Leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms. I have blessed peace with my Lord so near. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning. Safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Amen. You may be Welcome to Grace and Bible Baptist Church this morning. We're so glad that you have chosen to uh, be pr the privilege that we have. It's just amazing to me that we are able to meet in God's house and uh, uh, just the thought that we are able to worship the Lord this morning. We are actually being ushered in uh, through our praises and our thanksgiving and the songs and the giving and the preaching. We are being ushered into God's throne today and we're able to worship Him. Uh, what a tremendous privilege that it is. We're so glad that you're here today. So if you would, I want you to grab your Bibles and uh, I want you to go ahead and stand again. We're going to do a little exercise this morning and uh, stand and turn to Psalm chapter 5, Psalm chapter 5. And if you would follow along in the reading of God's word and I uh, just want you to concentrate on the words of this uh, scripture and these verses and uh, just give your heart and mind over to the Lord this morning and allow him to speak to you and to worship him in the way that he wants today. Verse 1, Psalm chapter 5 says, Give ear to my words, O Lord, consider my meditation. Hearken unto the voice of my cry, my King and my God, for unto thee will I pray. My voice shalt thou hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee, and will look up. For thou art not a God that hath pleasure in wickedness, neither shall evil dwell with thee. The foolish shall not stand in thy sight, Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. Thou shalt destroy them that speak leasing. The Lord will abhor the bloody and deceitful man. But as for me, I will come into thy house in the multitude of thy mercy. And in thy fear will I worship toward thy holy temple. Lead me, O Lord, in thy righteousness because of mine enemies. Make thy way straight before my face. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the reading of the word. And God, I thank you for the thoughts and the praise toward you that are contained in these verses. God, I just pray that you would lift our hearts and our minds, uh, everything about us toward you, and help us to focus in and concentrate and really truly worship you today in this hour that we have. God, we thank you for it. We thank you for the ability and the freedom and the privilege to meet here together today. And God, I pray that you would just do the work that only you can do in our hearts and in our lives and change us from the inside out through the service today and through the preaching and singing of your word. Bless this service, Lord, and I pray that everything that happens would be your, to you, not only to your honor and glory, but to your liking and to your pleasing. God, we thank you for this. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Please remain standing as we continue to sing. 
All right, our next hymn is I Would Rather Have Jesus. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather have Jesus than riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be His than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or lands. I'd rather be led by His nail-pierced hand than to be the king of a vast domain and be held in sin's dread sway. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world of about you all but I sure love to hear that you know it's one thing to sing at your house and you know you're off key I'm off key <laughs> I don't know if you all are but I am but to hear in God's house everyone it's it's awesome but this Sunday obviously we we're uh, honoring our grads we have two excellent grads that are uh, graduating one I think is staying around here the other is going to go off to uh, the military so we're certainly thankful for these two grads first off we want to honor I mixed up the Bibles again sorry Ariana Gip, uh, Rivera right now, she's going to get a Bible because we, what we do here at Grace and Bible Baptist Church is when they graduate, uh, what better to give them God's word, right? Because this is what's going to guide them and direct them. Obviously, we're going to train them, and uh, we're certainly proud of Ariana. Uh, I, me and my wife have been here for three years, and we've certainly seen Adiana grow in the Lord, and she's one of the ones that uh, takes notes every service, every service. So we certainly are proud of her. And the next is Justin Harrington. He's going to be going off to the military very soon as well, too. So we certainly need to pray for him as he'll be uh, taking that endeavor for his next step. Uh, 
Those are our two grads, and right after the service, we know, obviously, this is different times, but we've set up for them to set up their vehicles, and they're going to have a trunk display. So, uh, basically, they want some cash. So, <laughs> if, if you've got that, and if, if you're not able to right now, be sure to bring it back next week or sometime and just address that. But we understand right now we can't really have fellowship or uh, cookies and whatnot. So, what we're doing this morning is just going to honor them with the trunk uh, blessing, okay? Thank you. Thank you, Brother Richard, and uh, congratulations, graduates again. Well, we'll be praying for you, for sure. Uh, so I just want to make a few announcements. Uh, of course, on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m., uh, you can tune into uh, Facebook or our YouTube channel and uh, uh, have thoughts from the pastor. Uh, so Brother Roy will be uh, doing those on Wednesday nights uh, in lieu of our services here in the auditorium. And then also uh, resuming on June 5th, that's this uh, Friday, we have youth meeting on Zoom at 6 p.m., uh, so make sure high school students, junior high students, you avail yourself to that. And then Saturdays at 5, uh, Brother J.D. does uh, Junior Church. So you can also watch those videos on there. Uh, it's just interact with our kids and just keep them, um, keep them going at this time. So uh, thank you again for those of you that have been on uh, online giving or you've been dropping your tithes and offerings off. Uh, the boxes today are on the information desk and the table just outside the doors. Uh, they're a wooden box. We took them off the stands just to be a little bit easier to find, just so you're aware of those things. Again, you can pull out your phone even right now and go to graysonbbc.com. Uh, click on the give link there, and you can do your tithes and offerings through there, whatever's convenient for you. So this time we're going to have a word of prayer, and then we'll get on with our service. Father, we come before you so grateful for your love. Just thank you for the opportunity you give us to meet here. And Lord, we ask you just to bless the services that, that remain. We thank you for preparing our hearts through the singing of your word, and what a joy it is to sing together in corporate worship. God, I pray that you just bless the offering, that you bless the gift and the giver. We think about our missionaries around the world that are serving you. We pray that you'd protect them, that you'd give them fruit for their labor. God, we pray that you'd just bless the preaching of your word today, that you'd speak to our hearts through it. Pray if there's someone here that doesn't know you as their personal Savior, they may come and receive you today. We just thank you for what you've done and what you will be doing in our lives. We ask you to do all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This time we'll have a special by Miss Jennifer Webster. lost everything for the wife who feels betrayed the child who is afraid for the home that is broken by the scars of sin and shame there is hope and there is healing in the power of Jesus name there is a way, there is a light, there is life in the blood, the blood of Jesus Christ. You can be saved. He paid the price. This is the gospel, the gospel of Christ. For the heart that is longing for love, for the mind so confused, the one who is abused, for a world that needs mercy and the truth that makes us free. There's forgiveness and cleansing at the cross of Calvary. There is a way, there is a light, there is life in the blood, the blood of Jesus Christ. You can be saved, he paid the price. This is the gospel, the gospel of Christ. 
Well, I want you to imagine with me this morning uh, an imaginary scene that uh, I want to reiterate has not happened, okay? Uh, for those of you that are watching on Facebook or YouTube, this did not happen. This is an imaginary scene. But I want us to go in our imaginations this morning and just imagine that this afternoon your pastor received a call from Michael Jordan. And when I get the call, uh, of course, I'm going to think that it's one of my sorry friends that is playing a joke on me. And so, actually, when I get the call, what I do is uh, I ask, actually tell him that I think it's a joke uh, and that I need him to hang up. And if it's really Michael Jordan wanting to talk to me, he needs to call me back on Zoom so that I can see him. And so, he calls me back on Zoom, and uh, we get to having a conversation, and uh, he says... Pastor Roy, what I need uh, and I'd like to do is I would like to have a, a basketball camp at Grayson Bible Baptist Church at the school there in your gym, and uh, it's going to be a week-long basketball camp, and so when we do this, what I want to do is uh, we're going to have all the proceeds and all of the money that's raised uh, because of this basketball camp go to help uh, relieve people that are uh, starving in different situations in South America. And uh, so what I want you to do, now you got to think about it this with me. The, the best basketball player that has ever laced up a pair of shoes is talking to me on the phone about enlisting my help to work together with him. And as a matter of fact, he says, uh, what I want you to do, Pastor Roy, is I want you to teach the defensive part. So what I'm going to do is I'm, Michael Jordan would say, I'm going to teach the offensive part of the, the Bible, the, bat, the, the, yeah, the Bible camp, the uh, basketball camp. And what I want you to do is do the defense. And so what I want you to do is I want you to play defense on me, Michael Jordan would say. And so you can show everybody how to play defense. Now, that would be absolutely ridiculous. Uh, there's, no, there's no level outside of my dreams right before I wake up where that is a logical sequence of events. So with that in mind today, I want to talk to us about something that is a hundred million times more ludicrous than what we just described. And that is the fact that the God of the universe, the creator and sustainer of all things, wants to work together with you. Now think about that. God Almighty wants to work together with you. He wants to rub elbows with you and be your co-worker. He wants to partner with you to give the gospel to the needy people around the world. To help love and care for the poor, abused, and forgotten group people groups uh, around the world. God wants to speak through your mouth. He wants to reach out and help people through your hands. He wants to finance all of this through your account. He wants to go and, and to gather and to get to these places through your feet. God has determined to do His work on this earth through us. And that's an incredible thought. Now think about this. When you pray for your mother's, let's say that hypothetically you are, your mom has cancer, and when you pray that God would heal her from cancer, what does he do? Well, God calls in all the doctors. He enlists the help of medical teams and hospitals and specialists. Uh, he enlists the help of pharmaceutical companies and rehab centers and labs and all types of other things, all run by people. God doesn't come down and go pow on your mom and heal her of her cancer. God utilizes all of those people in all of those areas and many more to heal, if it's his will, to heal your mother of cancer. He utilizes people. God utilizes people to do his work here on the earth. Now, he doesn't have to do it this way. He has chosen to do it this way and to use us 
in his work. He is co-laboring with us. He is our co-worker. We get to work together with the Lord. Go in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And let me show you this. Uh, This group of verses here in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 are going to kind of shed some light on this concept. It's it's absolutely amazing. I've been studying and thinking about this all week. Uh, and the fact that God wants to work together with me. I mean, I was a very mediocre worker when I was working a regular job, what I consider a regular job, uh, outside of the ministry when I was in Bible college and high school. I mean, I was just barely a passable worker. Uh, I think I did pretty good. But let me tell you, the fact that God actually wants to work with me is amazing. What a thing and what a concept that we need to understand and explain today. Verse 1 of 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Go there in your Bibles with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 1. The Bible says, And I, brethren, Paul is speaking here. He's the writer of the what was a letter uh, to the church at Corinth, this church that he started. Uh, he wrote this letter to them, and this letter now became, because of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in the writing of it, it became the book of what we consider now 1 Corinthians. And so Paul is speaking to the church at Corinth and to us uh, through time. He says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk, Paul says, and not with meat. For hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, Are ye not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another of, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? Now here's what's going on. The church at Corinth has a lot of sects and groups, cliques, if you will. A group of people over here on this side are all followers of Paul. And they, he was the founder of the church. He's the one that planted the church in Corinth. He's the one that won them all to the Lord. And they're all, all allegiant and all of their uh, following is uh, uh, following Paul. And over here we have some people uh, that were discipled by Apollos. After Paul left, Apollos came in and began to pastor the church. And so this group is all about Apollos over here. And we find in other areas of this letter in the book of 1 Corinthians that some people were like, y'all can be of a Paul and y'all can be of a Apollos, but we're of the Lord jesus christ and so they were like the really you know uh snooty kind of people that were uh basically saying that because it made them feel better uh so there's all this division in the church and paul writes them and he says i'd like to write to you about spiritual deep matters of the faith but i I can't paul says i cannot do that because you are still walking in the flesh you're still living a carnal worldly lifestyle and if you weren't There wouldn't be division and strife and arguing and debating in the church. So what's Paul saying? In a roundabout way, he's saying that if there's division and strife and arguments and and fighting and and, and bickering and, and backbiting in the church, the church is living in a carnal state. He said there's no difference. Basically, you walk as men, he says there in that one verse. You're basically walking just like people outside the church that don't even know the Lord. You're acting just like the heathen and those that are unbelievers act. Now, this has absolutely nothing to do with the message. I just wanted to point that out. Verse 6 gives us our thought about working together with the Lord. But I do want you to understand what's going on in the context because what's happening here is some people are are raising Apollos up above a level that he should be and and some people are only coming to church. Now think about this. They're only coming to church because Apollos is there. They're only serving the Lord because they love Paul so much and they respect him. It has nothing to do with their walk with the Lord. It has nothing to do with serving God. They just do what they do in their Christian life because they're following their leader. So verse 6 says, Paul speaking, he says, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Now, this is the explanation of the concept. What Paul is using here is an illustration of about farming. And again, I always make this disclaimer, I know nothing about farming, okay? I have done a couple farming kind of things in my life that were just a one-day deal, all right? I have no 
knowledge except for what I've read about farming. But what I do know is that you take seeds and you plant them in the ground. And then uh, you cultivate and you do a lot of different things, watering them and doing things so that they will grow. But let me tell you, no farmer on the face of the planet can put life into that seed. Can't do it. They plant it. They water it, they take care of it, they try to protect it, they put fer, uh, all kind of fertilizer on it, they put insecticide nowadays, they do all these things to protect the growth of the seed, but they cannot put life in the seed. But here's something else. God doesn't leave the throne and come down and plant the seed in the field. Have you ever seen God do that? If he ever does that out here in this field beside the church, we're all going to freak out. God doesn't come down from heaven and plant your seed. So what Paul's saying here is, I have planted. He planted what? He planted the church in Corinth. Now, Paul was not the one that saved everybody. He didn't uh, give everybody the ability to change and to grow in the Lord and become a new person. But he did, physically, humanly speaking, he started the church. He's the one that went to Corinth and figured out where the church would be. He did all the research, he did all the recon, and figured out where the church would be planted. He went out and talked to the first people. Uh, he basically gave them the gospel uh, vocally, and they accepted Christ. He says in chapter 1 that he only baptized a couple people. He had other people that baptized the members of the church. He organized the church. He instituted the rules uh, and the regulations according to the Bible. He taught them. He, he discipled them. He prayed for them. He worked with them. He went to the hospital to visit them. He planted the church. And if we want to say it this way, humanly speaking, if Paul didn't go to Corinth and plant the church, it didn't get planted. After Paul left Corinth to go on to other missionary journeys, Apollos came in and he became the pastor leader of the church at Corinth. And so what did he do? He watered. He helped the growth of the seed of the gospel. They were already mostly saved. They were already mostly just, uh, baptized as members of the church. And then Apollos came in and had some seminars. He had some, some of this class and that class. And he was probably meeting in their homes. And he developed those Christians by the teaching and the preaching of the word of God. He watered the seed. But God gave the increase, the verse says. God did what they, Paul and Apollos, could not do. And so what he's saying here is that we all three worked together for the church at Corinth to get where it was. Follow along, verse 7. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now, he's addressing the division and the strife again in the church. He said, look, I'm not anything, and Apollos is not anything, and other people that have taught you are not anything. They're just the workers that God designed to help you to grow, to do the physical human part. Now, he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Now, I'm glad for that. You're not going to get my reward for what I've done in watering and planting. And I'm not going to get your reward. And it's certainly not going to be a deal where I get judged or I get uh, uh, kind of taken aback or I get penalized by any way if you don't do what you're supposed to do. See, that's a great thing. And, and I don't mean to be political, but God doesn't work on socialism. It's not everybody throw the money in the pot and everybody gets rewarded the same. God is going to judge and reward you on your life and what you did, and it has nothing to do with everybody else. And I thank God for that. It's a really scary prospect at times, but I do thank God for that. So he says, verse 9, watch. For we, that is Paul and Apollos and all the people he's talking to, we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. God has determined in his wisdom and in his love and mercy toward us, he's determined to allow us to get involved in the work of the gospel. We are involved in kingdom work. And God has designed it that way so that he's dependent, because he designed it so, 
He's dependent on us to do what he needs us to do in order to get the gospel around the world. If you don't give your money, there's no money. I have not seen God rain down money for missions since I've been alive. Never seen it happen. Now, God blesses people. And then people, with the blessing, give to missions. But there's always people involved. Now, I'm talking to you today about partnering with God in prayer. So how does all this working with God every day and being a co-laborer with God, how does it work? How does that happen? It happens in prayer. How would you know what God wants you to do if you don't talk to him? You say, well, I'm just doing what I think is uh, what God would have me to do. Uh, I've done that a couple times, or well, more than a couple. I've done that a couple times as a husband. Just do what I think my wife wants me to do. It hasn't worked out very well. I found out in my 27 nearly years of marriage that it's a lot better to go ask her what she wants me to do. And then I don't waste all this time trying to do things that I think she wants that she doesn't want. And so we are able to be co-laborers, co-workers with God, but you're going to have to talk to him to find out what he wants you to do or else you could spend or waste your whole entire life thinking and doing things that you think God wants you to do that God never designed you to do at all. E.M. Bounds, a great author about prayers, said this. He said, he who would get anything out of his prayers must be in perfect harmony with God. Now, you see, prayer is not just spiritually whispering some kind of words. It's not some kind of holy mumbling to yourself. It's not some kind of calling down some holy power, mystical power, uh, to do your bidding Prayer really is obedience. It's partnering with God. It's saying your partner, God, has asked you to do something for the greater goal or good, and you say yes, and you get it done. That's what really prayer is. Prayer is communicating with your co-laborer and saying, God, if you can do this, and I know you can, if you will do this, then I will do my part. What is my part, God? What do you want me to do today? And then go do that in the strength and the power of the Lord. That's what prayer really ought to be. Now, see, we've relegated prayer down to this strange duty. It's a job that we have. To be spiritual, we're supposed to go into our prayer place, wherever it is, and we're supposed to lift off all the things that we wish God would do for us. Well, asking God for things is part of prayer, but let me tell you, if you're going to partner with God, the main thing you need to do is get in your prayer closet and say, God, what do you want me to do today? What's my job today? I'm looking at it like it's a, a secret mission. I always like those secret missions and all that spy stuff and all that thing. That's what I do every morning when I go to my prayer time. I say, God, what's my secret mission today? What am I doing? And he tells me. And I do it. And then I don't worry about whether I'm wasting my life doing things that are my ideas or my preferences. I know that from on high, I've talked to the Lord this morning. I know exactly what I'm supposed to do today. Philip Yancey said in his book entitled, Does Prayer Change Anything? He said, to call God and me unequal partners is a laughable understatement. And yet by inviting us to do kingdom work on earth, God has indeed set up a kind of odd couple alliance. God delegates the work to human beings so that we do history together with God. Our relationship with God is based on constant negotiation. We inform God what we think should be done in the world. And in the process, God reminds us of our role in doing it. Now think about that. 
How many times has a pastor or, or a youth pastor or a, youth, a, a teenager stood up in front of the crowd of the church or wherever they were and said, you know, God called me to the mission field or God called me to be a pastor. God called me like this or like this. And what happened was I was praying for this city or I was praying for this group of people and I was praying for this or that or the other and God just told me finally, you go do it. I've heard that testimony probably thousands of times. That's what prayer's about. Get your marching orders from God and go do it. Ecclesiastes 4, 9, and 10 gives us a little bit of idea about this. It says two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. Is it no wonder that we're so discouraged and depressed and down in our life? We're trying to go at this thing alone. We're trying to do it in our own strength with our own ideas and our own thoughts and our own ways. And all you have to do is go to God in prayer and say, what do you want me to do today? You know, in the last couple months that I've been doing this, there's been a couple days where he hadn't said anything. I said, well, cool. I get a vacation today. And the Lord says, yeah, just, just have a good day. And sometimes he's told me to do something. I go, oh, I don't want to do that. And so me and the Lord talk about it for a minute. And he always wins. You know, there's been some great partnerships in the history of mankind, even mostly in our century. The Wright brothers, great combination there. Lone Ranger and Tonto. That was an awesome combo. Great partnership. Batman and Robin. Bert and Ernie. For some of you that were born before me, Laurel and Hardy. I even think that the combination of Long John Silvers and A&W Root Beer that you find in Durant, Oklahoma. Thank you, Durant. I think that's a great combination. Let me tell you. I go down there, every time I get a chance to go through Duran, I stop at that place. They have Long John Silver's fish, which I know it's not good for you. But when I go in there and smell it, I don't care. And the fact that you can sit down with Long John Silver's fish and the hush puppies and the fries, and then you can put a a cold draft in the cold icy mug, A&W root beer alongside of it. Son, that's amazing. That's a great combination. But can I tell you, none of these combinations or partnerships come close, anywhere close, to the privilege and the honor that it is to work with my Lord. So as we conclude this morning, I'd ask you a hard question. Who are you partnering with? Are you partnering with God? Or are you partnering with yourself? Maybe the only one you consult about what you do is you. Maybe everything that you do in your life is about you. You might even be partnered with the devil. See, the Pharisees in the Bible, they didn't realize that they were partnered with the devil. John 8, Jesus gives them that understanding that their father was actually the devil. And they're doing the things that the devil wants them to do. You know, there's times in our lives when we can get partnered up with the devil and not even realize it. We can do his bidding. We can advance his cause. Some of you here this morning might be partnered with all three, all the above. That was my favorite answer on multiple uh, questions, multiple choice, all the above. That is almost always right. You might be in partnership with God, yourself, and the devil. But that's not going to work. You're not going to be able to live the Christian life that God designed for you. Amos 3.3 says, can two walk together except they be agreed? How can you actually walk together and be in partnership and be co-laborers with the devil? I 
I want to ask us this morning, and I want us to think about it and contemplate it on this week. Who am I partnered with? You have the opportunity of a lifetime to partner with God Almighty. The creator of the universe wants to work together with you. He wants to give you a job to do. He wants to give you something to make your life worthwhile. He wants you to get involved in the big picture. And he will instruct you every single day if you'll ask him in prayer. And he'll give you the resources and the abilities and the talents to do what he's asked you to do. You just can't beat that. However, some will continue to live their life either partnering with themselves or partnering with the world or partnering with unbelievers or partnering with the devil. And they will look back on the end of their life and have absolutely nothing to show for the time that they spent here on this earth. And what a tragedy that that would be. Some that are listening to this message, maybe even here in this auditorium, if you can't partner with God in prayer and work with God alongside God because you've never believed in God and you especially have not believed in His Son, Jesus Christ, and what He did through the gospel. You see, God cannot partner with you if you're still living in your sins. You must repent of those sins and allow the Lord Jesus Christ to cleanse you of those sins and to give you eternal life. We call it salvation. That absolutely has to happen before you can partner with God in prayer. But if you will come to the Lord this morning, the God of the universe would be happy to partner with you in prayer. And to go to work together with you and I to accomplish his goals for this world that we live in. Would you stand with your heads bowed and your eyes closed this morning? Every head bowed and every eye closed. Heavenly Father, I can't even imagine why you would want to work together with me. But, Lord, your word is very clear on the fact that you want to partner with us. You want to work together with us, and you've even called us your friends. You've called us co-laborers together with you. What a, what a tremendous concept. It's, it's even hard for us to grasp. It's hard for us to, to fathom the fact that you would want to work with us. But you have designed this Christian life that way. You've made it to where... You depend on us to work together with you to get the job done. And God, I'm so grateful for that. It's an amazing thing. And Lord, thank you for showing me what you've showed me in the last couple months about prayer and the fact that we get our job description, we get our job duties every day, and we should get them from you in prayer. We need to know exactly what you want us to do so that we can be a good employee, so that we can work together with you in the way that you'd want us to. Lord, help us not to be a bad employee that that tears up things, that's not showing up to work on time, that's not doing what should be done. Help us to be a great co-worker with you. And God, if there's one here or maybe watching through the Facebook live stream, Lord, that does not know you as their personal Savior, doesn't know what it's like to really pray, doesn't know what it's like to believe, doesn't know what it's like to have the Lord Jesus Christ in their heart and have the peace that passes all understanding that one day they will be in your presence in heaven because of what you did for them on the cross of Calvary. Would you help them this morning to understand the gospel and even maybe to reach out to us, maybe to come to this altar and ask one of our counselors here in the front, Lord, if they, we could show them how they could be saved, how they could know for sure that they're on their way to heaven. Would you help them to do that today? God, we're going to thank you for whatever happens in this moment of invitation and introspection. Lord, we just pray that you'd work in each and every heart. And God, that you'd help us to partner with you in prayer. And we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As the instruments play, we have just a moment of invitation. We're just going to call on you to ask.